The Bronte family lived in the Haworth Parsonage behind me. We're going to take a room by room tour and find out more about this fascinating family. Haworth is in West Yorkshire and the Bronte Parsonage is at the top of the village. There is plenty of parking at various locations. We could park right next to the house and prices are reasonable for a few hours. The museum is run by the Bronte Society, set up in 1893, one of the oldest literary societies in the world. It opens from Wednesday to Sunday and you can book tickets on this website in advance or on the day from the booking desk behind the house. You enter the property via the side gate and from the pretty front garden. Entry is staggered as the rooms are quite small. The house on Church Street was built in 1778 as accommodation for the resident minister of St Michael and All Angels Church a few steps away. And from 1820 to 1861, that would be Patrick Bronte and his world famous family. To learn about their life story, do watch our video from last week, where we walk in the footsteps of the Bronte sisters following their short, tragic lives. The house was modernised and improved by Patrick's successor, Reverend John Wade, and this gabled right wing was added, which is now the exhibition room. As we wait to enter the house, notice in the garden the plaque that marks where a gate once opened into the churchyard used by Patrick and the family to access the church and where their bodies pass through heading to the family vault. In 1928, Sir James Roberts, a successful local man, purchased the parsonage for £3,000 and gifted it to the Bronte Society. It opened as a museum on the 4th of August 1928, with hundreds coming to visit on the first day. We enter the house into the entrance hall with its stone flagged floor and pale blue painted walls. To the right is Mr Bronte's study. He would carry out his parish business in this room and gave the children lessons. The cabinet piano was purchased by Patrick in 1830 and mainly played by Emily and Anne. Recently restored, it is in playable condition. Note his magnifying glass on the table that helped with his failing eyesight. He decorated the walls with engravings of biblical scenes by John Martin, similar to those seen today. A picture of a young Patrick hangs between the windows. Across the hall is the dining room, also used as the family room. Charlotte, Emily and Anne would do most of their writing here, collaborating around this table at night, reading aloud their ideas and correcting each other. Mothering Heights, Agnes Grey and Jane Eyre were all written here. It was also where Charlotte worked alone following the death of her sisters. she was able to afford to enlarge the room in 1850 following her writing success. Anne would sit in this rocking chair next to the fire. It's believed Emily died on this dark blue sofa in December 1848. A plaster medallion portrait of Branwell Bronte by his friend and sculptor Joseph Leyland. The 
The portrait above the mantelpiece by George Richmond of Charlotte was commissioned by her publisher George Smith. This is a copy the original hangs in the National Portrait Gallery. The tall shelves either side of the mantelpiece are full of books the family read or used as reference. Charlotte converted this room into a study for her future husband, Arthur Bell Nichols. It was previously a storeroom for coal and firewood, with a door out to the back of the house. This was bricked up, a fireplace added, and a door created out into the entrance hall. The wallpaper is a reproduction of the original. The room is filled with items from the old Haworth Church, as it was rebuilt after the Bronte's time in 1879. Only the tower is original. Arthur nursed Patrick after Charlotte's death and hoped to be his successor. However, the church trustees decided on Reverend John Wade, so Arthur returned to his native island. The long case clock is believed to have been owned by him. Across the hall, the last room on the ground floor is the kitchen. This is an interpretation of what it might have been like, as Reverend John Wade made alterations, removing the original range, blocking up the window, and adding a larger kitchen extension not seen here. The Bronte Society does display some original china, utensils and furniture belonging to the Brontes to give a feel for what it would have been like. The sisters would have helped in the household tasks, along with Aunt Branwell and one or two servants. When Emily became housekeeper, she would have spent much of her time in this room. Climbing up the flagstone stairs, Halfway up on the right is a mahogany long case clock, made by Barraclough's in Haworth. Patrick would wind the clock every night at 9 o'clock on his way to bed. Further up the stairs is a copy of Bramwell's portrait of the three sisters that once included himself. He was not happy with it and removed his portrait. Arthur Bell Nichols took the original back to Ireland, where it laid folded up in a cupboard for many years. The original is in the National Portrait Gallery. At the top of the stairs are four rooms to explore. The first is the servants' room. Two servants, the Gar sisters, moved into the house with the Brontes. They were followed by Tabitha, or Tabby as she was known. A Haworth woman, she served the family for 30 years. This room has had some alterations and exposed areas of the original blocked window can be seen either side of the fireplace. A contemporary art exhibit by Hannah Lamb called Fragment of a Dress is on display until December 2022. The window looks out over the overgrown churchyard. This is Charlotte's room, but would have been Mr and Mrs Bronte's room when they arrived in 1820. Mrs Bronte died in this room of uterine cancer on the 15th of September 1821. The room still has the original fireplace, and now showcases many items of clothing that Charlotte was able to purchase and wear following her literary success. This striped silk dress is believed to have belonged to Charlotte. It was found in a cupboard behind a blocked off wall in 1936. Research and comparing to other dresses in the collection attributed it to Charlotte. There are a few other personal possessions in this glass cabinet worn by Charlotte, Black mittens, silk socks, and black satin slippers. Her friend Ellen Nussie gave Charlotte this decorative fan.
This is her wedding bonnet, veil and artificial flowers. There are a number of other bonnets in the collection. Along with a variety of shawls she purchased, a very versatile accessory for a lady of the period. Aunt Bramwell took over this room when she decided to stay in care for the children. She would teach the girls needlework and household management skills from this bedroom. Following her death in 1842, it was used by various family members and guests before Charlotte enlarged it and made it her own following her sister's passing. The children's study that we'll see next was made smaller to accommodate this change. She shared this room with Arthur Nichols until her death, also in this room, on the 31st of March 1855. This oil portrait of Charlotte was painted after her death by John Hunter Thompson, a friend of Branwell Bronte. Called the children's study, this is where the four children played and created their imaginary worlds, sparked by the purchase of a set of toy soldiers for Branwell. We spoke about this in more detail in the last video. They wrote tiny books for soldiers to read. It is also likely that at some point this was used as Branwell's bedroom as he was the only boy. This was Mr Bronte's bedroom after the death of his wife. All the beds in the house are reproductions as none survived. He had lived through the Luddite violence and clergymen were often targets. He therefore kept a loaded pistol by his bed and strangely would discharge it daily from the window across the churchyard. Branwell also started to sleep with his father in this room when his alcohol and drug addiction made him unpredictable. Apparently he may have once set his bed on fire, being saved by Emily. Bramwell died in this room on the 24th of September 1848. The last room in the original house was at one point Charlotte's bedroom and then a passageway when Reverend John Wade added the extension. It was for a period Bramwell's studio and is laid out as such today. He set up as a portrait painter in Bradford, but this came to nothing and within a year he was back home and in debt. The display highlights his chaotic mind with papers, bottles and drawings strewn all around the room. We now pass through into the exhibition room, part of the extension of the house. This is the largest collection of Bronte artefacts in the world. Shortly after Patrick's death, the house contents were sold at auction. The possessions started to become popular amongst collectors due to their fame, and items became dispersed across the globe as friends and relatives sold off what they had inherited or been gifted by the family over the years. In 1893, the Bronte Society was founded to try and halt the dispersal and bring together all the items again, something that continues to this day. The exhibit tells the story of their lives. We shared that last week, but we wanted to show you some of the wonderful items on display in this exhibition, as it is truly amazing to have such a large collection. We have picked out some highlight items. This is Emily's writing desk. The sisters had one each. It's made of rosewood, and the contents have been preserved. Globs of sealing wax, a pen and nibs, 
and a small envelope can all be seen. It's interesting to know that Patrick himself wrote poems and published this book in 1811. This was his inkwell, beside which are his spectacles. This neck scarf was worn by Patrick. A marble paperweight in the shape of a prayer book belonged to Patrick. The Apostle's cupboard belonged to Thomas Eyre of Hatheridge. Charlotte had seen it during a visit. She may have taken the family name as the heroine in Jane Eyre, which she wrote a year later. The cupboard is graphically described in the novel. This is a copy portrait of the 15-year-old Mrs Bronte. And this is a watercolour when older. I believe these are the only two drawings of her known to exist. A small bottle inscribed M.B. Maria Branwell, Mrs Bronte's maiden name. A selection of toys the children played with. Some were found under the floorboards in the children's study in 1949. Next to that is Emily's artist box, still splattered with the remnants of paint, with a little ink pot, sealing wax and some envelopes. A book of rhymes, a tiny book containing ten poems Charlotte wrote set in her imaginary world. Another tiny book, a dramatic poem written by Bramwell. This exhibit also shows some of the early drawings of Bramwell and Charlotte. A silver medallion presented to Charlotte when she left Rowhead School. A knife and fork set used by Charlotte at Rowhead. And her painting box, believed to have been used at the school when she studied art. This is Charlotte's workbox and sewing materials have survived with many interesting items intact. This stained glass window came from the Red House in Gomosal, we visited in last week's video. Mary Taylor, Charlotte's friend, lived here. Charlotte described the window in her novel Shirley. A writing desk, pen holder and sugar tongs are believed to have been owned by Charlotte. The trunk was purchased and used by Charlotte during her travels in Brussels. The chair belonged to Ellen Nussie, who commented that it was Charlotte's favourite when she came to stay. The Greyhound sculpture was another example of the work by Joseph Leyland, friend of Brownwell, who created his portrait in the dining room. This is Charlotte's Spanish lace funeral veil. A plaited necklace made from Emily Bronte's hair, previously owned by one of the family servants, Martha Brown. A hair bracelet and necklace made from Anne Bronte's hair, given to Ellen Nussi by Charlotte after Anne's death as a memento of her lost sister. This brooch also contains a lock of hair from Anne and passed to Ellen as well when Charlotte died. This is the funeral card of Emily's burial service. As we leave the exhibition room, on the ground floor is a further exhibit highlighting some of Charlotte's garments and accessories. Whilst all are interesting items, one highlight is this blood-stained handkerchief belonging to Anne Bronte. She died in Scarborough of pulmonary tuberculosis and it was possible the blood stains are attributed to her fatal illness.
we'll be back in Haworth in a few weeks' time to take you on a walk of the town, including the church. But let's look ahead to next week. The wonderful Rochdale Canal with its beautiful coloured barges and pretty surroundings pass right through the lovely town of Hebden Bridge, crammed into the hillside of the upper Calder Valley. We'll take a walk along the towpath and explore this very popular mill town. So that was a wonderful tour around the house. So many fascinating artifacts that they've managed to retain. Really enjoyable, hope you enjoyed it too. We've got more like this on our channel. If you like this one, you may well like our Jane Austen. But nevertheless, we'll see you again very soon. Thanks for watching, bye bye.